Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. I'm so blessed and so excited to be talking about the cannabis renaissance with none other than Steve D'Angelo. Wonderful to be here. <laughs> what's up? <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. We had a really powerful conversation at New West Summit. Shout out to Jim McAlpine and New West Summit, the world's leading cannabis tech conference. And Steve is at, he's 40 years of a cannabis activist, cannabis advocate, cannabis entrepreneur, cannabis educator, speaker, author. He has been there, done that. And, <laughs> and he's now pushing for the future of cannabis in so many different ways. Um, okay, bio on Steve. He's the founder of Harborside Health Center, which is the largest medical marijuana dispensary in the world. He's also the co-founder and president of Arcview Group, which is the first cannabis investment firm linking up investors with cannabis and vice versa. He's also the founder, co-founder of Steep Hill Labs, which is the first laboratory testing facility for cannabis analytics and also the author of the Cannabis Manifesto. He's had 12 white papers. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. He's the host of Green Flower Media. So you can take a video selfie and send it in and get a question, get your cannabis questions asked. So this is the perfect person to be talking about the cannabis renaissance with. Steve, I want to know how the hell you got started with this. Oh, uh, well, it was really simple, right? I, I fell in love with cannabis at a very young age. Uh, and I didn't want to be a criminal for the rest of my life. So legalizing cannabis became a prerequisite to my own personal happiness. It's, it's something I had to do. I made it my mission. Uh, I thought we were going to get it done in two or three years, uh, and I would be on to some of the other things that I really care about. Um, it just took a lot longer than I thought. And here we are a half century later, and we've seen a tremendous amount of movement, but also you've had to work your ass off blood sweat and tears and so many other people's blood sweat and tears to get here so let's talk about you know you fell in love with it what were some of the like these first big pushes that had to happen in the trajectory of getting it to where it is today yeah well you know cannabis was let's think about how cannabis how and why cannabis was made illegal in the first place right because it didn't have anything to do with the properties of the plant itself. There was no science that lay behind this. The laws against cannabis in North America were passed as a means of racial control to control black people and brown people because that was the first people in American society who started using cannabis. So you go back to the very first cannabis laws before federal prohibition, 1911, 1912, 1913, in border states like California, like Texas, like Arizona. Why? Because you had hundreds of thousands, millions of brown people coming across the southern border of the United States, fleeing the violence and the chaos of the Mexican Revolution, and they brought their medicine with them. Because even going back a hundred plus years and thinking about what cannabis was like on the planet, for the longest time prior to any of this, of this criminalization of the actual medicine. It's like, that's, that's, that's what Earth wants. Earth wants the plant to be there for humans to use and, and flourish with. And now we, have, we had a period of, of this, and it was racially, racially targeted criminalization. Yeah, well, you know, it's, 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 it's a very interesting history that goes, that goes way back. Right? And if you, if you go back far enough, what it turns out is that elites of, of any kind, generally, whether they're economic elites, religious elites, ethnic elites, have been deeply suspicious of cannabis and of other visionary plants, because the authority of the direct experience that you have when you are in communion with these plants is stronger than the authority of any outside government, religion, ethnic group, or anything else in the world. And so elites have always been suspicious of cannabis. You can go back it, before we saw the kind of horror show with prohibition that we've seen here, 
You go back to Spain in 1492 when Ferdinand and Isabella started the Spanish Inquisition, one of the first things that they did was to ban the consumption of cannabis, which at that time in Spain was very common and just as acceptable as using alcohol was. Uh, you can go back to the seventh century in Egypt where you can find the working class folks who followed a, a branch of Sufi Islam and consumed cannabis prolifically came into conflict with a ruling elite from a much more conservative school mm -hmm. of Islam. And, and actually in Cairo, in a garden, in a public garden in the middle of Cairo, cannabis consumers were strapped into chairs and had their teeth pulled out publicly without anesthetic to discourage people from consuming cannabis. So there's been this tension between elites and cannabis for a long time, long time. Um, and it's a beautifully way, way that you put it is there's a communion with the infinite that occurs that is just way more profound and divine than anything a government or a corporation or some control authoritarian mechanism can put on to someone. Yeah, I mean, for me, the way it works for me, and cannabis works differently for, for, for everybody else, but yeah. cannabis, cannabis opens me up to the consciousness of the cosmos. Uh, and, and the authority of the experiences that I have with cannabis are way stronger than anything else. So for example, right, <clears throat> when I was going to school, uh, uh, I was taught just like everybody else was, and came up through the American public school system, that, that, that the world is based on material, on stuff, on chemicals, on structures, right? The idea that there was magic was something that was relegated to, 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 to children's stories. The idea that, that, that I myself was like a part of nature, mm. no, I was a human being who manipulated nature and stood outside of it. That was the consciousness I was raised in, right? Then I had my first experience with cannabis. And my first experience, I mean, you might have talked about this before, I'll recount it very briefly because it's a pretty mm. good story. Uh, I, I, I smoked a joint after school at a friend's house. Nothing happened until I was headed home. And I was headed home through a park, 13-year-old kid. The park was just a thoroughfare for me. It was, it was something I passed through every day to get from point A to point B, but I never really noticed, noticed. Right? Yeah. until this day. And I'm got like, what's that warmth on the back of my neck? Oh, oh it's the sunlight. And, well, look how that sunlight's filtering through the leaves of the trees, and it's, it's casting these patterns on the path, and oh, there's these dry leaves here, and I can smell them and hear them as, as, as my foot crunches on them. In the background, I hear this gurgling of a creek, and now sweat's coming up from the sun on the back of my neck, and I'm in the middle of all of this thing. I'm like, I'm responding to it physically. I'm connected to it. I am part of this web of nature, right? And I felt this transcendent, moment of being, of being, right? yeah. of being a part of nature. That experience was stronger than anything that I was ever, ever taught about standing outside of nature and not being a part of nature and manipulating nature. And it gave me a reverence for Mother Nature. It gave me a reverence for the natural world that's really become the core of my, of my spiritual practice and my political orientation to the world. Unlocking that, co that cosmic connection to, to our, from our consciousness to, through to nature and to what exists around us for every single person is so crucial to have stewardship for Earth and to have a collective unity moving forward. That's, this, is a, this is one of the many tools and resources that we need for us to, to all be able to to, to, to connect in that sense. Well, this is why I talk about the cannabis renaissance, right? <clears throat> and so there's this very, very interesting thing that's happening now. You know, we, we, we have seen that modern science has validated all of the ancient medical uses of cannabis that, that are, you know, that have been documented for thousands of years for all the grave illnesses like cancer and Alzheimer's and epilepsy. That has been very well documented, right? So we know that cannabis provides wellness effects for individuals. Another thing that we've just begun to learn in the past six, seven years is what happens to our society, to people at large, when we make cannabis more accessible. And what we found, just go consult the public 
records of any cannabis reform state, like the state of Washington or the state of Colorado, <clears throat> there's now 10 legal adult use states. So we have a body of evidence here, and what we find is, without exception, alcohol sales and consumption drop, pharma sales and consumption drop, overdoses, fatal overdoses, opioid overdoses drop, binge drinking drops, suicide drops, domestic violence drop, crime drops, rapes and thefts in Washington state dropped 10 to 30 percent relative to their neighbors who did not legalize cannabis. We know that cannabis helps veterans readjust to a more peaceful lifestyle. We know all of these things are, are documented, right, in records. <clears throat> so think about this. If we know that cannabis helps people resolve their disputes more peacefully, to value their lives and the lives of other people more with, with, with more tenderness, with more preciously, right, if it helps them be more in touch with, 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 with those things, right? What effect might this have on more intractable problems that are less tangibly measurable, right? We can measure the rate of pharmaceutical sales. But what about racism? What about sexism? What about homophobia? What about disconnect from nature, right? What about religious and ethnic intolerance? What about warfare? What about genocide? Right? Could cannabis, if it spreads far enough and wide enough to enough people, have that kind of effect on the planet? Right? And I think the answer is yes, that's why I've spent all these years doing this. Yeah. And that's on both this really profound individual level of of finding a harmony and a, a, a union with, with nature and with the sisters and brothers around you, um, but also on a planetary level um, as well. And then um, there's this, there's this other, there's another really important aspect to it, which is with proper testing um, for um, properly being able to uh, take cannabis and put it into its forms that each individual desires for its desired uh, outcomes. And then also the, the taxation that comes from that and funneling that into education and transportation and infrastructure and, and all of the things that are so um, important for the, the children of our world to, to go in and, um, and of course further research and development. And, and um, yeah, so, so then there's the, 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 that side as well in addition. Yeah, science, the science of cannabis is just, you know, it, we're learning new and more amazing things about this plant all the time, right? So one thing that many people don't know about cannabis <clears throat> is that our bodies endogenously produce many of the same or virtually the same chemical compounds that you find in the cannabis plant. And the neurotransmitter system that manages those compounds, the endocannabinoid system, is the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. Right? It's everywhere. All of our organs, our brain, our skin, our connective tissue, our immune system, everywhere. Right? So I was in Jerusalem a few months ago visiting Raphael Meshulam, who is the guy who discovered the endocannabinoid system, the guy, <coughs> or, or one of the people who helped discover the endocannabinoid system. He's very famous for having discovered THC. Mishulam was asked a question, given what we know about how widespread the endocannabinoid system and its role in maintaining and restoring homeostasis, the, the body's natural balance, which is why cannabis is effective for all these different diseases, right? Dr. Mishulam, do you think that it may be possible that cannabis would have a therapeutic effect for every known human medical condition? Yeah. Now, Mishulam, very, very cautious guy. He understates routinely. So I was expecting him just to shoot it down, right? No, we don't know yet. We are a little bit of a pause. And then he says in this you know, kind of quiet but very firm voice, right? yes. I think that would be a fair statement. So think about what this means, right? It means that, 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 the exist, that, that, that we now have the key in one plant, potentially, to address 
every single human medical condition. Right? Maybe not fully resolved, but to address, to ameliorate, to bring people uh, back to wellness. Right? Here's the tragedy. Today, in the vast majority of medical schools around the world, and when I say vast majority, I'm talking like upwards of 95%, the endocannabinoid system is not covered. It's not in the anatomy books. It's not, oh. in, it's not there. It's not there. We've known about it since the 1990s, and our doctors are not being taught about the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body because there's some elites that feel threatened by this yeah, plant. This, this, right? this is pharma, this is tobacco, this is alcohol, this is the, the governments around the world that want to rather have ignorance rather than the communion with the infinite and each other. Um, there's a, that in, that's nuts that the science has been there for so long now. Um, now, I, I think this is really important to cover since we're here right in the science and the health and um, the individual use of it. Um, you've, been, you've been a huge uh, proponent and advocate for figuring out how to optimize and with research and development the right synthesis of cannabis for each individual's needs. So how do we do that? Because you, 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 know, you have Steep Hill, and Steep Hill is only one of of many of the, of, the, of the pieces to this puzzle. So how do we get, how do we get there? Right, so um, the, the cannabis plant turns out to be an incredibly complex plant. Uh, and there are at least two major sets of compounds in it that, that are responsible for the effect of cannabis. One of them, one family is cannabinoids, the other family is terpenes. And in both categories, there are literally you know, hundreds and hundreds of these compounds. And, and in any individual sample of cannabis, you, you can find literally dozens of different terpenes and dozens of different cannabinoids. Depending on the strain of the cannabis, each strain of cannabis will have, each variety of cannabis, will have a slightly different or sometimes very radically different cannabinoid and terpene profile. So this is both a problem and a huge potential, right? It's a problem because if you don't know what kind of cannabis that it is that you're getting, you can get a very wide range of differing effects. And it might not necessarily be the effect that you want at any given time. So, you know, people who consume cannabis regularly have noticed that, that, that the effect varies from strain to strain of cannabis. Sometimes you're delighted, sometimes you're disappointed if you don't really know, right? So we are just now really beginning to, the, to, to understand what these different profiles are and the effects that they have on human beings. It's just in its infancy, right? Yeah. So dozens of, of cannabinoids and then dozens of terpenes per plant, per per strain. Exactly. Okay, so let me give you an example. Jeez. You may have a, a, a variety of cannabis uh, that is high in THC, right, uh, and low in CBD. Those are two different cannabinoids. And that strain of cannabis, say, may also be uh, high in uh, a terpene called limonene and low in a terpene called myrcene. Uh, what you would find with that cannabis is it would tend to give you a very stimulating, um, uh, joyous kind of effect, right? Uh, maybe almost giddy. And a big difference if it's smoked in a joint or a blunt or five milligrams or a hundred milligram edible, etc. Yeah, uh, there's also a huge difference in, in the method of ingestion. So when you inhale cannabis, you feel the effects almost immediately. When you drop a tincture of cannabis under your tongue, right, you'll feel it in about 10 minutes and it'll wear off in about an hour to two hours. When you swallow those drops of cannabis tincture in a cup of tea, yeah. it'll take you about an hour to feel them and it won't wear off for six or seven hours, right? Yeah. So there's, there are also product format questions that, to, to look at. Now, 
The one thing that I would alert consumers to is, is that there's, 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 there's both peril and promise here, right? The promise is that one day we will get to the point where you will be able to go into a cannabis dispensary and you will be able to select a variety of cannabis that very, very reliably gives you the effect that you're looking for, yes. right? We're not there yet. And so if you go into a dispensary today and you see products that are labeled with specific effects, understand that, that those are creations of marketing departments. And those are not yet backed up by real and hard science. So a lot of brands are really, you know, they're trying to assign these effects. The science isn't really there yet. So don't get disappointed if you, if, if, if you, if you, if you buy something that's supposed to be, you know, take you up and it takes you sideways instead, you know. Don't give up on trying to dial it in. We are going to get there. But like with everything with cannabis, we're just emerging out of the dark ages, right? And cannabis you know, has this, this kind of dual history, right? Um, if you go back to our very earliest medical texts, when human beings first started even thinking about wellness, cannabis is amongst the very first substances that is mentioned. Right? Uh, and and, and the, the plant has been revered as a medicine, as a sacrament, as a, as a, as for its social uses um, for millennia by almost every single culture on the planet. Right? It's widespread. You can't, there's, there's no place that you can go on planet Earth and not find cannabis. But then there's always been this trouble with the elites, right? Because, because you get this direct connection to the cosmos because the authority of that direct connection, because the authority of sitting next to a plant and hearing that plant say something to you is more powerful than the authority of sitting in a classroom and listening to what a teacher tells you or sitting on the other side of a television set and listening to what a president tells you. Elites have always been threatened by cannabis. I'm really happy that you're tying it into the elites over and over again and into the communion with the cosmos over and over again. And I'm happy that you're sharing with people that there is a, <clears throat> that there is a process to dialing in the cannabis experience for each individual. It'll take us some time to be able to properly figure it out. I still, it's still nuts that, that there's, there's so much data then uh, each, on each strain than if there's, you know, a dozen cannabinoids, a dozen terpenes, then that's just so much data. And then the individual, then you have to know about their endocannabinoid system and you have to know about what ailment that they want, whether it's sleep or hunger or pain or whatever it may be, creativity. Um, there's so many different things to, to explore and stimulate and, and excite and, and enjoy and so, and heal. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is it. That's right. It's a, the, the essential consumer problem for cannabis consumers is finding your way to the right kind of cannabis. The, the, the nice thing about it is, you know, it's, you know, it's a kind of enjoyable journey. And the, the worst thing that's going to happen is, you know, maybe you'll get a little bit too hungry or a little bit too horny or a little bit too tired <laughs> from time to time. But these are all survivable things, right, on the, on the pathway to wellness. And you have all of these materials are right here up on steep hills under science, under services. Go and check them out. Um, the links in the bio, everyone, go and take a look because this is a really good asset to be able to unpack and dig in and better understand um, what's going on. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about um, let's talk about ArcView as we as we move in because I, I want to I want to talk about you know cannabis culture and um, this is kind of an interesting um, segue into that because um, we really need a huge push for all of the things that we were discussing about the science, the research, um, the use to be um, highlighted through media in a way that is positive and enriching. And there's a lot of, you know, you were just telling us about the conference in Las Vegas. You didn't, if you didn't know it was a cannabis conference, you couldn't even tell that it was a cannabis conference. So it's very businessy in many ways. So how is ArcView working to bring it up in the best light? 
So ArcView was, was, was formed uh, way back when California was the only legal cannabis state anywhere in the world, right? And it was restricted to medical cannabis. But my partner, Troy Dayton, and I knew that this legal industry eventually would develop and that as it developed, that entrepreneurs, people who built cannabis businesses, were going to need growth capital. They were going to need investors to invest in them so that we could eventually grow into a mainstream industry. And that was why one of the reasons that we created the Archie Group on its most basic level to introduce these cannabis entrepreneurs to investors. Right? But there was another idea at work there. This was just after Obama was elected. And, and we knew, because Troy and I were students of American history, that quite likely what came on the other side of Obama was, was going to be less favorable to cannabis. And that we had four or maybe eight years to make as much progress as we could to make sure that, that ball did not get rolled back on us with the next presidential administration. And, and, and we also knew that, that, the, that, the, that, or we believed that the key to doing that would be creating a, a legal, responsible, politically engaged cannabis industry. And that that industry would draw into it, mainstream business people would draw into it, mainstream investors would draw into it, all of the kinds of people in our society who have more power and more credibility, who have been walled off from cannabis by prohibition for all of these decades. Right? And, and, and the coming down, the beginnings of legitimization in California gave us an opportunity to do that. And, um, and it, it worked out very, very nicely. Right? Um, uh, $220 million in 195 ventures. Yeah, and, I, and, and it's the ratio of that number that I think that I am proudest of, because if you divide those numbers, what, what you find out is, is, is that we seeded a lot of companies with relatively small sums of money. Today, some of those companies are the most well-known cannabis companies in the world, companies like MedMen, companies like MJ Freeway, companies mm -hmm. that are going public on the Canadian Stock Exchange um, and yeah. creating you know, fabulous amounts of, of wealth and huge numbers of jobs and, and, and tax revenue. So it, it, it did, it, it worked out well. And so today, you know, if you want to close down the cannabis industry, like if Mr. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, when he was still Attorney General, wanted to do. Good people you, don't use marijuana. What? <laughs> good people don't <laughs> smoke marijuana. Right, right, good people don't smoke marijuana, right? Um, uh, had we not created this industry now that, that, that is so big and so legitimate that's getting, you know, quarter billion dollar investments from companies like Constellation Group, right, he would have been able to roll us back. Instead of sitting here with you today doing this interview, I very well could have been sitting in federal prison yeah. uh, awaiting trial on cannabis conspiracy charges or maybe even convicted. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you said something right there that was so profound from our last conversation that I want to come back to it for the show is that um, as you've been seeding more than a million dollars per venture um, as ArcView, it's really important that you said that some of the companies are going public on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Listen up, people. If we don't figure out how to be at the forefront. California has been at the forefront of cannabis for so long that other places in the world will gladly list co companies on their stock exchanges. And the U.S. will <coughs> geopolitically not, not be at the forefront. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but it's gone. We, the, the United States is, is not going to be the leader of the global cannabis industry that it should have been. We gave birth to this industry, and specifically we gave birth to it in the state of California. And because of the Department of Justice of the United States of America, we are now seeing billions and billions and billions of dollars of wealth creation, which eventually is going to be trillions of dollars of wealth creation yeah. that has moved to Canada, that has moved to Australia, that has moved to Israel, that has moved to countries that have a much more enlightened understanding of cannabis and are embracing. And in Israel today, there are human clinical trials for cannabis medicines going on for autism, for schizophrenia, for epilepsy, for a whole range of other conditions, and they are going to be patented and owned by companies that are not U.S. companies. 
And that is the fault of the Department of Justice. The global cannabis industry should have belonged to the United States. Yeah, my, my, my whole body is like just tingling with just feeling grateful that, you know, Israel is, has been moving forward with so many of this, but that our Department of Justice has held back some of the most important progress that California birthed and that we could have had. And maybe yeah. we can catch, maybe we can catch up as, as people like you and hopefully media arms like us can get more of the, of people um, pushing in this direction. There's this whole agony and ecstasy thing going on, right? You know, like I'm in agony, you know, because, because this industry that we worked so hard to create here now is, is you know, like the biggest parts of it live somewhere else. The guys who are running the big public companies in Canada, they didn't come out of 30 or 40 years of cannabis experience. Yeah. A lot of them were, you know, running gold mining companies or oil companies. And they're, I'm not, not to say that I'm not happy about it. I'm glad to see that the mainstream business world has adopted cannabis, right? It's a really, really important thing. It doesn't really matter in the end who makes the money off of this plant. What really, really matters in the end is that every single human being on the planet who needs and can benefit from cannabis gets it, right? We've seen cannabis move through the hands of some of the most vicious, murderous, corrupt, evil organizations that human beings have ever formed. And we've seen that for decades, not just in the Mexican border, but around the world, okay? It still works its magic. It still creates peace and love and joy and happiness and healing wherever it ends up. So I'm not afraid of corporations taking over cannabis. There's not enough hippies in all of California, in all of North America, for us to do the job of getting this plant into the hands of every human being around the world. To do that, we have to engage the same mechanisms of global commerce mm -hmm. that are used for every other good and service in the world. Totally. Okay? So I'm happy that the corporate players are here, right? Happy, it's, it is in many ways the culmination of my life's work. On the other hand, the big question is, is, is cannabis going to cannibalize the corporations Right? Or are the corporations going to corporatize cannabis? Right? And my hope has always been that the influence of cannabis, what we see it do everywhere else, it's also going to happen in business. That we don't just create a new industry that looks like every other global industry in the world today, right? that we create a new kind of industry right? that embodies the lessons that we've learned about what we've created already as a species, that does better than that, that reimagines that, that breaks old molds and opens up new possibilities. You know, this industry becomes what we make it. It is brand new. The norms, the standards, that's up to us to, us to write. And so shame on us if we don't create an industry that embraces diversity as a strength that understands sustainability as a basic threshold issue that, that ensures that every single person in the industry who creates value receives adequate and generous value in return, we've blown it, right? All we've done is more of the same if we do that. We can do better. We can do better than that. We have to do better than that. <clears throat> you, you illustrated in a way that is, you know, there's all of these sort of E e commerce mechanisms and marketing strategies and, and inclusivity strategies across geopolitical relationships across the planet on every single good that you see. Your computer, your socks, your plants, your food, your everything is moving around the planet. The way that cannabis has an opportunity to be the first of its kind in terms of commerce in a different way and marketing in a different way of education in a different way um, and healing in a different way there's so much potential for that that if if we can properly bring that light forward um, even even using some of the funnels that are pre-existing mm -hmm. um, that that could be a very optimal sort of progress for us. 
Well, this is, I mean, I think that the, you know, the ability to influence the already existing funnels is, is why cannabis holds more potential than anything else that I can think of to really address the intractable huge problems that face our planet, right? The fact that we're, we're on the verge of destroying ourselves with hatred and technology if we don't get our acts together, right? And, and I don't believe that there's a political solution. There isn't. <laughs> right? I don't believe there's not, right? No. I mean, yeah. I'll tell it's you. It's about community, a, community and uh, yeah. coming together locally and not relying on leadership, governance, community. It's about starting in your immediate surrounding and going from there. The link, global thought and focus locally. What was the slogan I saw earlier? Do oh. we have that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Think globally, act, act locally. locally. Yes, yeah. but okay. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I started out life uh, at a time when the new left was, 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 was like, there was this thing called the new left in the late 1960s and early 1970s. It was about a bunch of American young people embracing socialism and eventually embracing communism. And I did that and I went on that journey, right? And then I went to Eastern Europe after the Berlin Wall fell down. Right? And, and at that time, I was really a believer in, in socialism and, 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 and redistributing and making things fair. And then I went there and I saw the horror show that communism had visited on the people of, of Eastern Europe and the horrible, gray, corrupt, conformist, miserable life that people were living. And, and, I, and it, it really made me take a look and re-examine re-examine that idea, right? Yeah. But then I come back to the United States and I take a look at, at capitalism in the 1980s and the way that huge amounts of wealth are just being shifted from people who actually work for a living to people who don't really do that much. Yeah. Um, and, and you now see these massive, massive inequalities in wealth, right? So I don't want to hear a, a political, economic, ideological solution anymore because what I've learned is that good people can bend bad systems and get good outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. And that bad people can bend, quote unquote, good systems and get evil outcomes. And that what really drives change in the world is what comes from our hearts. Yes. Right? And that's why cannabis, I have so much hope for cannabis because, okay, there's this thing, the stoner epiphany, right? And, 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 and it's, 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 it's the moment where you're like, ah, why didn't I think of that before, right? So the way that it works for me, maybe be the end of a day, right? Um, I, I, I come home, I sit down, I take a little bit of a token. Usually after that happens, I start replaying the movie of my day. And maybe I will like recall that I've been running down the hallway of Harborside, trying to get to a meeting really, really quickly, maybe blow right by the person who was trying to get my attention, maybe a new employee, hey Steve. Mm -hmm. And like, there's this dialogue that gets engaged. And, yes. and I'm like, dude, did you really do that? And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I did. And it's like, well, that was not too cool. How would you feel if you were that person? Exactly. Well, I would feel pretty shitty and not very recognized. Well, do you want to be responsible for that? Well, no, I don't. All right, well, there's your phone. You know, maybe you should pick it up and call somebody and text somebody and do something about it, right? And, and so... And then when they get that message from you that says that, I'm so sorry that I blew by you so quickly. Um, I have so much appreciation for you and I, will, uh, I would love to engage with you tomorrow. Um, let's have a tea, let's have a coffee, let's talk for a bit. You know, that, that person lights up because then they recognize that, that you had that reflection, that moment. They light up, right? But I also light, light up. up. Why? Because cannabis has helped me more completely be the person that in my innermost heart I really want to be. And that's what I think the core power of, of this plant is, right? Is that it helps lead us to our hearts, it helps engage this interior dialogue, right? Um, that I think is, 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 you know, it's the, it's the essence of most of the spiritual systems that we've ever built as, as a species. The, the deepest times of reflection 
of looking at ourselves in the mirror and looking at civilization in the mirror and seeing us objectively what we need to do to become a better person, to what society needs to do to become a better person, to limit the, the throttling grip of so many of the negative processes that exist and eradicate those parasites and move forward with the positive light is just so, it makes me feel real, it makes me feel warm, it makes me feel like that pinnacle of humanity that we can be. And, and I love you because you speak about it in a way that is so true and so, and so through, the, through the spirit of, of especially cannabis that's here with us at night. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Alan. It's, you know, I, I open my mouth and this stuff comes out of it and it doesn't really feel to me like it's me. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm blessed with a voice that allows me to channel some of this stuff. And I think that all around the world that there are, there's a mighty army. There are thousands and thousands, millions of peaceful warriors who are, who are being called through this plant to something, and I can't tell you that I know what this something is yet. We're all in the process of discovering it, creating it, but what I know is that we're all being called. Yeah, yeah. That I know. I, I concur, there is so, so profound, just, I feel like a Taurus, and I feel like the channel is coming right through my spine and my body, and there's just this magic coming through, and, and there's, a, uh, there's a strong drive in me to help others unleash that potential from within themselves. Now, um, on, our, on our way to the, to the close, I want to ask you about the... We've went through so much in the last half century, moving the ball forward to where it is now. <clears throat> what is our future with cannabis, with these big players. We were talking a bit about the markets and we were talking a bit about it geopolitically. Israel is doing human uh, testing with uh, autism and other um, testing, which is, which is amazing. Canada's having companies go on the public exchange. So, so you know, where, 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 do we, where do we see the ball rolling and also how can people help with this cannabis is, is is on its way to becoming the most important uh, raw material and the largest part of the human economy on our globe. Whoa. Um, uh, that's where I think we're headed. I think that 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 when the full potential of cannabis is realized and implemented, that we're going to see houses made out of hemp, that we're going yeah. to see clothing made out of hemp, yep. that hemp is going to be restored to our food supply, that we're going to be eating it, that we're going to be feeding it mm -hmm. throughout, the, throughout the, the food supply chain. Mm -hmm. I think that, that, that cannabis is going to be recognized as a tool, as a tool in domestic relationships, as a tool in political relationships. I see a time when, when world leaders sit down and they work out a naughty problem, they're not sitting down at a cocktail party to work out that really difficult naughty problem. They're sitting down and they're sharing some cannabis with each other to work out that problem. I see a day when all of the spiritual systems, the religions of the world today, and many of them are intolerant with each other, right? Where they can discover cannabis as a common root. Mm where we can begin to come together, where people of different faiths can become, begin to come together, where people of different ethnicities are going to be able to understand our common humanity. Why? Because we all have that same direct, direct connection to the starry cosmos, to the wisdom of the universe, okay? I think that, I think about a world that operates the way that a cannabis circle that's sharing a joint works, okay? Yeah. It's like when we're sharing a joint in and, and, and a cannabis circle and somebody comes up from the outside, it doesn't matter what color that person is or what kind of clothes they're wearing, it doesn't matter. You never like join mm -hmm. and, and block them out. You always take a step, you open up the circle mm -hmm. and you invite them in 
and you share, right? And, and, and then their presence adds to that circle yes. and adds to the energy of that circle. Their and humanity, their uniqueness adds to it. Another thing when you were talking about the circle, I was thinking about all the people that would ask each other, you know, are you, are you warm enough? Do you need a blanket? Do you need something to drink? We have some tea. You know, there's this community that happens. Think globally, act locally. Yeah. I can't, this is nuts that you're, you're seeing cannabis as the n number one uh, commodity of, of, of the future. Being anything traded. you make out of oil, anything that you make out of trees, anything that you make out of cotton, 95% of the pharmaceutical drugs, all of the alcohol, all of the tobacco, most building construction, most textiles, right? All paper goods, most packaging. Are you kidding me? Wow. All of that can be done with the cannabis plant. It can be done in a more sustainable and more economical way than it's being done currently, pumping up oil or cutting down trees or growing crops like cotton that consumes 25% of the pesticides used in this country every year. Right? Yes, cannabis will be the number one largest part of the world economy. It may take 50 years from now, but we're just at the beginning of the cannabis renaissance. It is going to change the face of the planet. Holy cow. <clears throat> <clears throat> Not only am I now starting to see all of the, 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 the packaging and the woods and the papers and, the, and the, these material uh, uh, cannabis uses, but also I'm seeing 95% of pharmaceuticals can be replaced by some sort of I potentially... I think so. I mean, that's nuts. We have Raphael Meshulam and a number of other scientists who have essentially said that the endocannabinoid system is the key to understanding, maintaining, and restoring human health. Plastics, okay? Plastics are made out of cellulose. That cellulose is pulled out of petroleum. Petroleum has a lower cellulosic content than does the cannabis plant. It does. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And plastic that you make out of cannabis can be made biodegradable. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult for me to look at really almost any aspect of the economy. Right? Like I was just in Las Vegas and Thank I you, Ronnie. went into all of these hotels, right? And, 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 and the carpets, the wallpaper, the furniture, everything in there is made out of some kind of composite fiberboard, plastic, yeah. petroleum thing. And so I walk into these places and they're just like all off-gassing. As soon as I walk in, my skin starts crawling, right? Because, it, because there's this toxic chemicals that are oozing into my air and oozing into my being, right? All of that stuff can be made with hemp. All of it. You can make hempcrete and build your walls out of hempcrete. Mm -hmm. You can make hemp carpets and have your carpeting made out of hemp. You can make hemp fiberboard and build your furnitures out. Of, and you don't need to use any of that toxic chemical crap that's heating up our earth and threatening the existence of our species. Cannabis can do all of that. My friend Jack Herrer said it years and years and years ago. It was true then, it's true today. Hemp can save the world. That's great news, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. great news, man. We've yeah. got something that actually works, right? It's like, you know, we have this situation in the world where people are in such despair, right? In such despair, we have young people who are, who are thinking up, you know, ever more imaginative ways to blow themselves and other people up, right? More horrifying ways. We've got this planet that's just cooking and heating and heating and heating and intolerance that just seems to be growing at this amazing pace, right? And here, is something real that we can hand to each other that has undeniable positive effect on these things. It's great news. This is a great time, right? If we celebrate this plant, if we tell the truth about this plant, if we share this plant, all of the challenges that we're facing are not insurmountable, okay? We're not so far gone that we can't restore our natural balance. Just like homeostasis gets restored in the human body, we can restore homeostasis on this planet. We can do that. It's there. Nature is strong. Mother Nature is kind. And we have within ourselves wisdom that we don't even know about yet. Mm -hmm. Cannabis can save the planet. Cannabis, a little bit of heart. 
And heart, yeah. Humans. Yeah, humans. Yeah. We're a part of nature too. Really important part of nature. I, yeah, the, the, the cannabis renaissance is, is all of what you've described in this episode. It's so many different pieces. This is not just something to go and roll up and light up. This is so much more than that. Yeah, I mean, for a long time, uh, you know, cannabis activists were looked upon just as, uh, you know, trying to make it easier for people to get high. And then we've sort of been looked at as, okay, we're trying to help sick people get better, okay? That's not my agenda, okay? I didn't know about the industrial uses of cannabis when I started down this trail. I didn't know really about the medical uses of cannabis when I started down this trail. I knew one thing. I knew that cannabis helped me be the person that I really, truly wanted to be and that it helped my friends around me who consumed cannabis to do the same thing. And we figured that if it did that for us, that it could do it for other people too. And we had enough faith in human nature to believe that if that happened, we'd end up living in a better world. And I think that we're beginning to see that happen now. Yeah. Um, thought along the way is where do you place other um, psychedelic experiences, uh, LSD, psilocybin, um, DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, um, where do you place these in a, in like maybe like an exper experience, uh, mm -hmm. experience a guide or book of yours around um, what could be done with? with They're all the teachers, right? Mother Nature has given us a lot of different ways to learn and some of those teachers are plants, plants like cannabis and other visionary plants. I think that cannabis is <clears throat> the cannabis is the most accessible visionary plant that we have uh, because of its healing properties, because it is such a kind and gentle and generous teacher. Mm -hmm. It's a very easy teacher. Some other visionary plants are more demanding teachers. You know, kind of yes. there was like always the really nice teacher that you went to who kind of <laughs> eased you into things, right? And then there was like, you know, the taskmaster. Some ayahuasca. You know, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think cannabis is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is, is a kind and, and gentle teacher. I think that there are many, many other valuable plant teachers. My belief is that you know what mother nature has given to us no human being has a right to take away and so every visionary plant every plant that grows on this planet we have a right to and anything that we make from those plants we have a right to nobody can say to me yeah. no don't use a plant that grows in, in mother nature steve last questions question that we love asking on the show what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world Oh, well, the most beautiful thing in the world is love, you know? It's the love that we have for each other. It's, it's, it's the only real answer that we have to our problems. It's the only real treasure and reward that we can, that we can take with us. It's the only thing that we really leave behind when we depart and go on to wherever we go. And it's probably quite likely the only thing that we take with us onto the next realm. Love. It's the most beautiful thing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank My you pleasure. for being this, this loving, caring human that is bringing what is needed to our perception. I really appreciate that so much. Well, thank you for the appreciation and thank you for giving me voice as someone who spent most of his career not having a voice, it's very precious to me, very valuable. Thank you so much. You speak as though you've been doing it for four decades. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Steve. Thank you so much You're for coming welcome. on to the show. Yeah. This has been such a pleasure. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Guys, go check out the links in the bio. Go check out more of Steve's work. Go check out Steep Hill. Go check out Harbor Side. Go check out. Uh, go submit. This is so cool. All you have to do is take a video selfie of your cannabis question and then. Any question. Any cannabis question and submit it to asksteve at greenflowermedia.com. Steve will answer your questions. It's super cool. So go and do that. Have that in the bio as well for you. And go and build the future. Go manifest your destiny into the world, everyone. 
Let's unleash the power of this plant in its fullest potential across every single industry and every single soul on the planet. Thank you, Ronnie Vogus, our director-producer. We much love everyone, and we'll see you soon. Peace.